And so, hi everyone. Um, there's a question, is everyone viewing automatically or do we need to each mute yourselves? Everyone viewing is automatically muted. So thank you, uh, Dustin Edgman, for answering, for asking that question. Um, excellent question. So now um, I just want to say um, I'm excited for everyone here to join us on our first big uh, webinar a video presentation for the Night Sky Network. We have a great guest tonight, uh, Dr. Stephanie Malam with the James Webb Space Telescope. She's the deputy project scientist. Hi there. <laughs> and while well, we're getting flooded with rain, she's about to get hit by a bunch of snow from the same storm system <laughs> out in Maryland. So good luck. <laughs> um, before we get started, I just want to make sure you can all get set and view everything. Um, in case you're unable to view our slides and you should be able to, we're going to do screen sharing in a minute. Um, you can download the slides at uh, bit.ly slash nsnjamesweb. That's with two Bs at the end. And I'm going to put that in our chat right now. Uh, slides. There we go. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we're going to have a Q&A at the end of the talk. And to do the Q&A, there's a couple ways you can ask us questions via the text box. And also, there's another feature in Zoom where you can raise your hand. And, and it's, these are all features visible in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. Um, I think that's true. Um, as of the host and the panelists, you see slightly different stuff than the people online uh, watching. Um, so yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's two separate things too. There's a chat box to just chat with each other and casually chat. And then there's a Q and A box where it actually lists your questions and keeps track. Cool. So um, just before we talk, I just have a brief minute to talk about some nice guy network news. Um, this is really our first webinar in this new format, and so that's the biggest news for the week. Um, the other thing is um, just about our outreach award pins. There's a bit of confusion on the announcement. So our deadline for logging the events this year was January 12th. But the deadline to actually order the pins for your club and for your outreach volunteers, that's actually still 10 days from now um, at the end of January. So there's still time to order additional pins if you need them. But every club that's logged events gets three free pins. And those pins, um, in part, some of the funding for the PINs and for the Night Sky Network in the past year is from the NASA InSight mission. And we had the PINs made before they had to scrub their launch for this year. And if you've seen the Martian or followed Martian exploration at all, getting to Mars is hard. And if you get there, you want to make sure your instruments are all working. And with their... Um, seismometer not working, that was a huge, that was basically half the mission. So they're putting it off um, and hopefully they can get another launch window in the next couple of years, which will be at least a minimum of two years to get back to Mars. That's how the Martian launch window works. Um, you get it every couple of years, you get 10 to 20 days-ish to get there. So that's hard physics, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay. And so, with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening, uh, Dr. Stephanie Milam, and her upcoming work on the James Webb Space Telescope's Planetary Science Observing Program. Dr. Milam works in the astrochemical has worked at the Astrochemistry Laboratory at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. And in March of 2012, uh, she was selected as the James Webb Space Telescope's Planetary Science Liaison. And under this role, she helped establish the Next Generation Space Telescope as a planetary science resource and has engaged the community in future observations and preparations and assisted the project to ensure that the capabilities of the observatory were actually suitable for solar system observations. <laughs> and in July 2014, Dr. Malam was appointed as the I'll just say JWST's Deputy Project Scientist for Planetary Science, and she will continue her role through the undoubtedly successful launch in 2018. And I'm going to turn it over to the good doctor. Uh, Stephanie, would you like to begin? 
Certainly, and thank you for the introduction. Um, as he said, my name is Stephanie Milam. I am um, the Deputy Project Scientist on James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, I, since I've been working on this project, um, a lot of advancements have come to making this super sensitive telescope that's supposed to see the first stars of the universe um, actually capable of observing um, planets in our own solar system, which happen to be some of the brightest objects at these wavelengths. Um, so I have a presentation for you. Um, I also have a series of links for more information on where you can find some things. Um, I'm going to show you and discuss with you what the observatory actually is, um, some of the potential science that we've come up with for um, solar system science, and then give you a status update. And then at the end, um, during your questions, um, which hopefully uh, everybody at the society will help me manage uh, questions, um, uh, I'll show you the video of the actual launch and deployment sequence, and um, you'll get to see how the telescope actually unfolds. Uh, you're also welcome to contact me. Um, my email is uh, stephanie.n.milam at nasa.gov. I'll give that to you at the end as well. Um, if you have any further questions or if you want copies of any of my slides or of the presentation, I'm happy to give that to you. So with that, I will start my presentation. Okay, I'm not going to be monitoring the chat or anything, so um, hopefully someone will come on and speak to me if I need to see something or do something. Oh yeah, we got you covered here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, this presentation, um, just in case you're on Twitter, uh, hashtag JWST is our, is our tweet. Um, and you can also follow us um, at NASA Web Telescope, where Telescope is sort of hacked apart. Uh, and um, you're welcome to tweet about this presentation um, as we go, or on anything latest and greatest that you may see. So what is the James Webb Space Telescope? Well, it's a, it's a multi-agency uh, initiative. This is the next generation space telescope that was um, directed by NASA to follow up the Hubble Space Telescope. As you know, um, Hubble is no longer gonna be serviced. Uh, we don't have a space shuttle to service it. It just had its 25th year anniversary, and um, it's time to move on to newer and more advanced technology than this, this ancient, this relic of a telescope. Um, even though Hubble is doing fantastic science and we hope that it lasts for another 10 years. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do that are complementary from Hubble and James Webb. So uh, especially here at NASA, we're really hoping the mission lasts a lot longer. But JWST or the James Webb Space Telescope, you'll hear me call it JWST throughout the presentation, um, is a joint effort through NASA, uh, ESA, which is the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. Um, it's being led here at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. Um, its main contractor is Northrop Grumman, and it has four science instruments which have been distributed across the agencies. There's a near-infrared camera, or NIRCAM, from, that's built at the University of Arizona. There's the near-infrared spectrograph, or NIRSPEC, which is uh, built by the European Space Agency. Infrared instrument. This is the same place that has done the operations for Hubble Space Telescope. It's a fully deployable um, infrared telescope, so it's not an optical telescope like Hubble is. It is infrared with a six and a half meter diameter primary. Um, it's a segmented mirror to get it that large, um, also to help with weight. Um, it's uh, operations are at uh, cryogenic temperatures, but it's not actually a cooled mirror. It's passively cooled just by sitting in the shade uh, from the sun in space. Uh, it will orbit at L2, or the second Lagrange point from Earth. We plan to launch in October of 2018, somewhere around Halloween. So start coming up with your best JWST Halloween costume that you possibly can. Um, we have a five-year science mission, but we think we'll be able to operate for over 10 years. 
uh, our limit for our mission is not uh, cryogenics. It is actually fuel. Uh, we have to use our gas to actually maintain the orbit. And I'll get to that in a little bit. JWST was built and designed to address four main science themes. Um, first and foremost is the end of the dark ages, the first light and reionization. So this is looking for the first stars in the universe. The assembly of galaxies, the birth of stars and protoplanetary systems, and last but certainly not least, uh, planetary systems and the origin of life. This actually includes your solar system. So who is James Webb and why did we name this observatory after him? Uh, James Webb was the second administrator of NASA. Uh, he uh, was the administrator from 1961 to 1968. He oversaw the first manned spaceflight program, which was the Mercury mission program, um, as well as the second program on Gemini, uh, Mariner and Pioneer planetary, planetary exploration programs, and he also oversaw Apollo. He was a big advocate for science, um, especially astrophysics and planetary science and research. Um, this is sort of what led to the huge research in the science research initiative with NASA, um, as well as technology and spaceflight. So as I said, we have this huge deployable telescope. This just sort of gives you a speck of what it looks like. Um, so you have a large primary telescope. So this is a six and a half meter segmented mirror. There's actually 18 segments. They're all gold plated. The mirrors are made of beryllium. Um, actually, it's almost like a bored out beryllium, which makes them really, really light. Um, being six and a half meters in diameter, that's quite a bit of mass. But uh, being bored out, it actually reduces the mass quite significantly. It's also very stable under um, different thermal conditions. So depending on if the mirror is hot or cold, we don't see a lot of change in the structure or the size of the telescope. All the light that hits the primary is directed into a secondary mirror, which then focuses it down into the instrument science module, which actually sits right behind the, the primary mirror. Um, you can't really see it in this picture very well, but there's other views later that you'll actually see it. All the science instruments are on the cold side of the telescope or on the top side of the sun shield. We do have a multi-layer sun shield. It's five layers. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but you can just imagine how big this is. Um, it's about the size of a regulation tennis court. It's very, very big. <laughs> um, we have a spacecraft bus, which contains most of our steering controls, um, all the machineries, the computers, the reaction wheels. Um, we have an antenna. Um, also that's attached to the spacecraft bus on the sun side. This is where we send and receive data from the deep space network. We have star trackers which help us point our telescope and tell us where we are in our sky. And we have one solar power array. Um, it's quite small considering, but um, we're always, it's always in the sun. We're never in the shadow of the Earth or the moon since we're in orbit at the second Lagrange point. So we actually get quite a bit of efficiency through this small solar power array. So compared to Hubble, James Webb is pretty big. It's almost three times the size and diameter of the Hubble Space Telescope mirror. Um, even though it's almost three times as big, the whole mirror itself is only about half the weight of the Hubble Space Telescope mirror. This is the advantage for using beryllium and um, boring it out in the back. Um, so even though we have an absolutely massive telescope in space, it's actually quite light um, with respect to Hubble. Um, this also went in account when we were doing the full design of the spacecraft. Um, for reference, I also have Spitzer over here where it's 0.85 meter diameter mirror. Um, Spitzer is significant because it actually covers more of the wave or the, the electromagnetic spectrum that James Webb covers, which we can see here. At the bottom of this chart, um, chart six, for those of you who aren't following my screen, um, you see the electromagnetic spectrum. So you see this nice little colored bar. Hubble operated from the UV into the near infrared, um, where one micron sort of is that limit of the near infrared. Um, so you can see HST. You can see JWST actually hits the very edge of the optical spectrum and goes all the way into the mid infrared, which was where Spitzer was optimized at. Um, the vertical part of this uh, graph actually shows you the light collecting area. So being such a large telescope, we actually collect a lot more light, which makes us a lot more sensitive. Um, we cover angular resolutions on the sky that are much better than Hubble. 
or comparable as you get to the far infrared or the mid infrared, excuse me, um, and significantly better than Spitzer. So JWST is optimized in the near infrared, and we can get up to 0 0.06 arc seconds of angular resolution on the sky, where uh, Hubble was getting about 0.14 arc seconds. <clears throat> So the sun shield. So we have this five layer sun shield. Um, it's made of this Kapton like material. It's a, it's actually a, a technology that hasn't even been released yet. Um, but it's, it's amazing. It's almost like tin foil. It's very, very light and thin, but it's actually quite durable. Um, each of the layers are actually separated by an air gap. That air gap ha actually helps us uh, cool the telescope even more. It gives us sort of a thermal insulation in between each layer. So on the hot side, or in the sunward side, on the bottom of the, the observatory, we're actually reaching about almost 360 degrees Kelvin, or 85 degrees Celsius. Um, whereas on the dark side, we're passively cooled just by staying in the shade, um, and we can, the telescope actually will be operating at temperatures around 40 Kelvin, or minus 233 degrees Celsius. Um, for Fahrenheit, those numbers are also on this slide, just for reference. <clears throat> So how do you launch a tennis court sized uh, sun shield and a six and a half meter primary telescope into space? We don't have rockets with payloads that big, so we have to fold it all up. Um, this is where we actually get the term of the origami telescope. So on the right of slide uh, chart eight, you'll see um, the actual configuration, the folded configuration for launch. This is going to be launched on an Ariane 5 rocket. Um, out of French Guiana. The rocket was actually provided by the European Space Agency. It's a very successful rocket, and we anticipate a very successful launch um, with this rocket. So the telescope's folded up and stowed and launched and deployed out to the second Lagrange point, which is 930,000 miles from Earth. The second Lagrange point is one of the five stable Lagrange points um, that we have around Earth. You can see them on the lower right-hand side of the slide. <clears throat> Hubble was an Earth orbiting uh, space telescope. This is why it was in a can. Um, so the, the sun shield was actually always towards the sun and the observatory could rotate and go around and always keep the sun um, away. JWST doesn't have that option. So we have to keep it somewhere where we can sort of stay in the shade at all times. So to do this, <coughs> we're actually, um, limited in what, what our field of regard is on the sky. So we basically get to see a donut in the sky at any given time. This is because when you look at how JWST actually has to operate, sunward side has to always be on the bottom side of the observatory. So we can't actually tilt the telescope with respect to the sunshade. So you get this sort of angle um, arc that we can actually observe at any given time, which makes doing nighttime or midnight observations complementary to the ground, um, quite the challenge. Um, but we do see the full sky at least twice a year. <clears throat> so for solar system observations, this can be quite a challenge as well. But basically what we'll do is we'll do most of our um, bodies in the solar system when they're near quadrature, are sort of at their further point from the sun and the Earth. So here's a summary of JWST and its vitals. Um, so we have this general observatory. As I said, it has four major science themes which cover all of astronomy and astrophysics. <coughs> we have a uh, five years requirement for our operations, but as I said, we anticipate 10 years or, or longer. The primary mirror is six and a half meters. That's 21.3 feet for those of you who prefer uh, using the, the metric system versus the English system. Uh, it's an 18 segmented mirror, five layer sun shield, um, about the size of a tennis court. We are, are in orbit at L2, um, not stationary at L2, but actually orbiting L2. So we're not in the shadow of the earth. Uh, we operate below 50 Kelvin. As I said, we're passively cooled. We anticipate the observatory's primary mirror to be around 40 Kelvin. Between the four science instruments, we cover wavelengths from 0.6 to 20 and 28 and a half microns. This and the instruments actually allow us to have multiple types of uh, imaging and spectroscopy. 
including filtered imaging, slit, integral field, and GRISM spectroscopy, coronography, um, which will be ideal for doing exoplanet studies, and aperture mask interferometry. The heart and soul of this massive observatory isn't the primary mirror or the sun shield. It's actually the science instruments. So I just told you that we operate from 0.6 to 28 and a half microns. That, that's through all four science instruments. Our near infrared instruments are optimized to, to operate between 0.6 and about five microns. Then the technology change um, actually converts us to going to the mid-infrared instrument where we cover the rest of the spectrum. Um, you can see that all of them uh, offer either spectroscopy, imaging, or both. Um, and we have a, quite a, a limited field of view, but it's still quite good, uh, being a couple of arc minutes in general. This is an extremely sensitive telescope. Uh, being so large, um, being state of the art, we have the best detectors that you can get now. Um, we are designed to detect the faintest objects in the sky. Um, the comparison that uh, John Mather, our, our principal science uh, scientist on the mission, actually has this statement where you can actually detect a bumblebee at the distance of a moon. Um, so these are nanojansky type of detection limits. But as I said, I want to look at the brightest objects in the sky. These are the solar system objects. Mars is the brightest thing you can look at in the near infrared in the sky. Um, and the mid-infrared, actually. So um, what we did was we were able to implement short exposures um, by using subarray modes, um, high-resolution spectroscopy, uh, fast-reading detectors, and um, basically we were able to come up with techniques and observing strategies where we could actually look at these really bright targets. The other thing is solar system bodies actually happen to move quite fast. So we had to make sure that we have this big floppy telescope, uh, tennis courts with a giant sail, basically, um, that we could actually track something moving across the sky at pretty high rates of motion. Those rates of motions um, were actually defined by Mars. Mars is an extremely fast moving object in our solar system. Um, it moves at rates up to 30 milliarc seconds per second. Um, so just for a, sort of a comparison, the average velocity of Mars if you wanted to calculate it out for the 30 milliarc second per second rate, is about 53,691 miles per hour. Um, for reference, Pluto is about a factor of five slower. <clears throat> so this is, the telescope can actually track things that are moving pretty fast across the sky, which is ideal. Um, however, we can't see the fastest moving near Earth objects or comets as they're flying right by. Uh, but we can observe them most of the time, which is really great. <clears throat> we also have an ideal angular resolution for looking at the solar system bodies. Um, this is just a chart giving you a perspective of how big these objects are in the sky. Even though we know Jupiter and Saturn are extremely big, you also have to take into account how far away they are from us. So their angular size is here. Um, and the first column showing you it, the size in arc seconds. The next column is in kilometers. And then you have our, our instruments on JWST where you can actually see how many resolution elements we can actually get uh, for each object on the sky. So we get a number of pixels. So we can actually really do some really fine sampling of these bodies. <clears throat> Unfortunately for Pluto, we're not gonna have the resolution that New Horizons had, but we actually have a lot better spectroscopy that we can do so we can get better characterization of these outer solar system um, bodies uh, just by knowing what's actually there, as opposed to general ice uh, and rock features. So what, what I've been working on over the last few years is sort of coming up with a unique set of science cases to, to motivate planetary scientists to use this general observatory. Um, traditionally, uh, planetary scientists have looked at these large astrophysics missions um, reluctantly and hesitantly um, and haven't been as keen on trying to use them for their own science. Um, at NASA especially, we're very picky and we want our own mission to our own body, for example, Mars or uh, Saturn, Titan, uh, Europa, etc. So um, 
but we also need to use observatories um, to support those missions as well. And JWST has a unique set of capabilities that actually enable a lot of science that we can't do from the ground or with orbiting, landing, or flyby missions. <clears throat> so I, um, I reached out to the community and I solicited people to actually help me work on this um, since I don't particularly study Mars and I don't particularly study uh, Uranus, for example, um, I needed the experts in our community to actually help us. So um, a series of papers have just come out. Um, they were published January 4th in the PASP. <clears throat> um, it's a special edition um, and it's, it's innovative science, uh, innovative planetary science for the James Webb Space Telescope. So um, this is the, all the papers, and this is links to their um, preliminary acceptance versions um, available on archive to anybody in the world. If you want the actual publications from PASP, I provide a link to that as well later. Um, so you can actually get the, the full published version of the articles. So what I'm going to do is just step you through some of these so you can actually see um, some of the science cases that these, these groups of people came up with for their given solar system target or targets. So the first paper or article was um, mine um, and basically it gives you an overview of the mission and operations and highlights some key things, including things like the overall science drivers. Um, so we cover a lot of molecular lines that we can't detect from the ground. Um, one of the most important ones for us in astrobiology or solar system science is CO2. Um, we absolutely have a very hard time um, observing carbon dioxide at high resolution, especially for small bodies in the outer solar system uh, from the ground. Uh, we also cover things like water, um, deuterated water, so we can get the D to H ratio, um, as well as methane and other features that aren't as easily observed from the ground. <clears throat> we'll be able to obtain um, spectral colors um, so we can determine the composition of small bodies uh, for every known Kuiper Belt object that we know today, um, which is a unique capability. Um, these bodies can be quite small and very challenging to observe with even some of the larger ground-based uh, observatories. Uh, we'll be able to do semi-annual monitoring of planetary weather and seasonal changes. Um, impact events, so when a comet flies into Jupiter, uh, we'll be able to actually observe that and monitor it uh, with time. Um, we'll be able to do near simultaneous mapping and spectroscopy of comets, so we can see um, how the, gust, the gas and the dust actually vary um, within a given comet, as well as from comet to comet. Um, one of the key things for JWST, especially for planetary science, is it covers a window of operations that we don't have any sort of full resource observatory that operates at these wavelengths available to the community. Um, this is because New Horizons is going to end, um, and our next mission to Jupiter actually doesn't even begin science operations until 2030. So JWST is actually prime, a prime observatory for us to use in the community to do our science to maintain a, a longevity, a current, um, our, our routine monitoring, just so we know the variations that happen temporarily. Um, unfortunately, Cassini is going to end in 2017. It's going to be a uh, uh, landed on Saturn um, ever so gently, I'm sure, um, to never operate again. But um, we've had some great science from it, but JWST actually has a lot of complementary work, as well as feeling, filling that gap before the next Jupiter mission or Saturn and Cassini mission. Near-Earth asteroids are something that are a hot topic right now for NASA. Um, not only for planetary protection purposes, so that we can detect them and know when they're coming to us, um, but also because we want to know what they are. These are the bodies that are most likely to have impacted Earth, brought us organics or other primitive materials um, that could have been the initiators of life or prebiotic chemistry. Um, so knowing what they're actually made of is something that we can do with JWST because they're, they're typically pretty small. Um, and they're very hard to detect from the ground, which is why it's such a challenge to do this for planetary protection purposes. Um, but 
knowing uh, what we can know about them is always ideal. So we'll be able to actually observe these bodies and determine what they're, they're made of. <clears throat> um, this goes for asteroids as well. Um, sorry, the last slide was asteroids. Uh, they both, asteroids and near-Earth objects both have the same or comparable compositions. Um, as I said, these, these, these guys tend to move really, really fast in the sky. They move a lot higher or faster than our rates of motion that we're currently set at. Um, so once we're in orbit, uh, we'll be able to test our actual rates of motion and hopefully we can detect things up to about 60 milliarc seconds per second, which opened up that window of, um, of number of targets that we could actually look at and observe. Um, otherwise, we have to wait till they sort of move into a further distance away from Earth or the Sun where they look like they slow down to us. Um. <clears throat> Comets are another small body in our solar system that are really, really interesting, and they come really close to Earth. We think that some of the Earth's oceans actually derive from comets since they're the primary carriers of water um, in our solar system. So we'll actually be able to monitor how much water, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide there is in each comet as they come around the sun. This is really interesting for us um, because that number varies. Um, the ratio between those three species actually varies quite significantly from comet to comet. So actually constraining what comets are made of and if they actually were the, the, the providers of water to Earth um, during the late heavy bombardment would be significant to know. <clears throat> so just as a comparison, I made this um, spectrum for reference where you can see the dark green line is the spectrum that was, that was obtained from deep impact. So this was a mission that actually flew to a comet and took a spectrum that covers the JWST wavelength range. However, it was very poor spectral resolution, as you can see, it just is kind of a blob of a line. Whereas JWST has resolution where we can actually separate those blobs into individual fingerprints of different molecules. So we can actually tell you how much methanol or how much deuterated water or how much carbon dioxide there is. Um, and we can, we can actually extrapolate those numbers with much higher precision and clarity. Mars, Mars was a huge surprise for us with JWST. As I've been telling you since the beginning of this presentation, it's one of the brightest objects. We really didn't think we had a chance to actually observe Mars just because it is so bright. Um, but we were able to come up with some very unique science cases. Um, where we can actually do global studies of Mars, which is highly complementary to all the orbiters and landers, um, because we can see actually where and how methane's moving across the entire surface of the, of the body, as opposed to doing flyby missions where we only get small little strips of the, the terrain and just little hot spots. With JWST, we get the full spectrum across the whole body. So we'll actually get to do full seasonal studies of of very interesting molecules, such as methane, but also water, and seeing where the water actually resides and how it trans or how it moves across the body during its seasons. <clears throat> Giant planets. These are some of the most interesting things in our solar system. We have no idea what's going on in them most of the time, and they're absolutely stunning, especially at these wavelengths. Uh, JWST is very sensitive to um, storms. Um, other atmospheric effects, um, and we'll actually even be able to see some of the aurora in these bodies. Um, especially the ice giants, we have no idea. All we've had access to for those bodies in space have been flyby missions, and they were brief and short-lived. With JWST, it's actually perfectly designed to, to observe Uranus and Neptune. Uh, these bodies fit ideally in each of our, in, in all of our IFUs, so we'll be able to get global spectrum um, routinely and actually see how these bodies vary, and we'll get significantly better images um, in the infrared than we've ever been able to obtain from the ground. <clears throat> the satellites of our outer planets are even more interesting. We now know that these things have volcanoes and they're constantly erupting or they're spurting out water or plumes of gas and dust. Um, with JWST, we have a sensitivity that we can actually see these things um, and get the composition of them as opposed to just a, a brief snapshot or image as H Hubble has only been able to obtain. 
Um, so we will have um, a nice cadence where we can actually monitor the geological activity of all these small bodies um, orbiting our planets. And Titan is one of the most interesting of all of them. Um, we know Titan has a very rich chemistry. It has oceans, it has uh, storms, it has a, a very dense atmosphere, and it's very organic rich. Um, Cassini has done amazing things, and the Huygens probe has done amazing things for Titan. But as I said, that mission's ending in 2017, so JWST actually will be able to follow up all the work that's been done from Cassini and hopefully lead us to the next um, mission where we can actually do full-on follow-up, maybe landers or another orbiter um, in that system. <clears throat> and again, JWST will have the global imaging that, that Cassini really didn't have. Rings and satellites have always been a challenge and they're a huge question. We really don't know what most of the rings um, for these large bodies are actually made of. We know that they're icy or dusty, but we don't know what kind of ice. So with JWST, we have the sensitivity and the spectral resolution that we can actually learn what these things are made of and um, maybe even detect new satellites, so even smaller moons, um, just because we'll have that sensitivity. The outer solar system is full of these tiny little icy bodies known as trans-Neptunian objects um, or Kuiper Belt objects. Um, we really don't know what they're made of. They rarely come into the inner solar system. It's not like they're a comet. Um, but whenever we get up close to them, such as Pluto or the next New Horizons target, uh, we learn a lot. We learn that they are organic rich. We learn that they can have atmospheres. We learn that they are very icy. So there's a lot of potential for learning um, what these bodies are actually made of and what that means for how the solar system formed and how other solar systems beyond ours actually formed. <clears throat> and one of the most unique studies that came out of all of this work was um, looking into how we could do occultations. Um, occultation observations are extremely useful and give us so much information about the tiniest bodies in the outer solar system. Occultation science has been very successful with SOFIA and a couple of other ground-based observatories. This is where the small body actually flies in between a, a nearby star or a bright object. And you just, you get the shadow um, imaging and spectroscopy where you, you can actually do the characterization, characterization of these really small bodies. You can even detect whether or not they have a, they're a binary or, or a triple uh, body system um, by doing such measurements. So this will be a really unique science thing. And JWST de definitely has the sensitivity and the angular resolution to do these very small bodies that we can't even do with the current ground-based facilities. So with that, I'm gonna move on to status and I'm gonna jump through this kind of quickly. Um, so I wanna give you what's, what the current status of JWST is um, since the replan um, in uh, 2011. Uh, so I'll just step you through it. So I have sort of an outline of what our yearly themes were. So in 2013, we began instrument integration. Um, in 2014, we started manufacturing the spacecraft. <clears throat> last year, the end of last year, we began assembling the mirror. This year, our big highlight is to actually finish assembling the observatory, um, including uh, the full mirror, putting the instrument uh, module on the back of the mirror, and then putting the spacecraft bus onto the, the observatory. In 2017, we'll be testing the system um, routinely over and over and over again, doing all the tests that we never did with Hubble um, to make sure that this observatory is gonna work the way that we expect it to. And then in 2018, we take it down to Karoo, um, where it'll be launched in late October. <clears throat> So I absolutely love this instrument because every time I give a JWST talk, everybody asks me why we can't service the mission. And basically the proof is in the pudding. If you look at the image on the left, this is our instrument science module. This shows you how complex, how packed in, and how completely chaotic it is that we have no access to any of these instruments at any given time. In order to maintain or service any of these instruments, you have to take the whole thing apart. So we absolutely don't have access to, to, to maintain or service any of these instruments in the future. 
Um, and ideally, it would be great to do, but it's probably cheaper instead of developing a whole spacecraft and robot to go and service it, um, as well as replacing the instrument, it's probably cheaper just to build a new observatory in the long run anyways. So the picture on the right shows you that instrument science module with all the electronics component and the radiator. All of that sits on the back of the primary telescope. And this has been very successfully tested and integrated. It's, ISOM is currently undergoing its final cryovac test with the four science instruments here at Goddard. It'll be completed soon, um, within the next month. And um, with that, it will be delivered to the observatory or to the project as a complete package. <clears throat> as I said, that test is currently underway. Um, there's, this is the third. Uh, there's been two more. This is the final one with our new detectors. There was a manufacturing glitch with our detectors that we found some degradation that we weren't very happy with. So new detectors were built and tested and installed on the instruments, and those are currently being tested as we speak. <clears throat> this is a very complex test. It's a massive cryo chamber, as you can see in this picture, the tiny little people standing at the bottom um, with respect to the, the massive structure. Um, so to cool this entire chamber down, it takes about 20 days. Testing is about two months, and then warming up is another 15 to 20 days. So it, it's, it's quite a long process, but they're, they're, it's been a very successful test so far, and everything's gone um, even better than anticipated. The telescope structure is also underway. Um, we built two backplane structures, uh, one we call the Pathfinder and one we call the Flight. <clears throat> the Pathfinder black backplane was designed for multiple purposes. One was to verify that we could actually deploy the secondary mirror, um, since this has to fold up and, uh, for launch and then redeploy. Uh, we needed to make sure we could do that and successfully do that. Um, it also gave us an opportunity to test installing the mirrors. Um, a special crane was developed where we actually scoop up underneath each mirror and the installation is done ever so gently without touching or um, scratching the edges of each mirror. Um, the Pathfinder is also um, testing the test equipment down at Johnson where we're doing an end-to-end -end optical test uh, later this year. <clears throat> This is inside of that chamber. It's known as Chamber A down at Johnson Space Center. Um, chamber A is very famous. This is where the Apollo capsule was tested um, with astronauts actually getting in and out of it under vacuum. Um, it was also in an aerospace vi aerosmith video. Um, so you might recognize it, um, though it looks completely different now. It was completely refurbished and redone for JWST. It's the only cryovac chamber in the world large enough to house the fully deployed JWST observatory um, without the sun shield. So the Pathfinder is there as we speak and going through a series of tests to actually test the optical test equi equipment, which is the end-to-end -end optical test that Hubble never had. Um, had they have done it, um, we wouldn't have had um, issues during the beginning of that mission. So the, the flight version is actually complete and at Goddard, this is uh, at Northrop Grumman right before it was delivered. And now it's sitting in our clean room and the mirrors are being installed. As of when I wrote this presentation, um, we had a number of mirrors that had been successful. Um, when I sent the presentation last Thursday, this was a view of our clean room. Um, so you can see that almost all the mirrors are now installed. Um, it doesn't look like the picture I showed you earlier with a crane and a nice shiny gold mirror because that was one of our backup mirrors. All of our flight mirrors are being installed with covers on them. <clears throat> The sun shield's also near completion. Um, all, all the layers are just about done, um, and all the engineer has been engineering for them has been completely tested um, with a full-scale model, <clears throat> including a full deployment test. So this is our full-scale model, and they actually had to actually practice uh, folding and unfolding this thing a couple of times, um, which you can imagine was quite extensive, especially considering we have gravity which we won't have during deployment in space. The spacecraft bus is also complete um, and being delivered. So later this year, as I said, we're, we're expecting to have our instrument science module completed within the next month or so, actually. Um, the mirror installation should be done very soon. I recommend you follow along on the webcam. Um, 
the construction of the Missions Operations Center at Space Telescope. So this is where Hubble's currently operated out, out of. Um, they had to redesign the Operations Center for JWST just because it's so much more complex than Hubble. Um, and the staff is going to be quite large, so they basically had to rebuild their, um, their operations center up there. Um, but it's nearly done now. Um, so in the spring, they start putting the instruments on the back of the, the primary telescope. Um, and then they do deployment and observatory commissioning plan. Um, so this is making sure we know how we're actually unfolding the telescope, when everything unfolds. Um, that it's not done too quickly or too slowly. We don't want ice on any instrument or anything popping off too fast um, as we're actually deploying the telescope. Um, so that'll be final soon. Um, this summer, the cryocooler will be um, tested and delivered and installed on the spacecraft. Um, and the spacecraft panel and avionics box will be fully in integrated. Um, then later in the year, we'll have um, the full end-to-end -end optical tests on the Pathfinder before delivery of our full observatory down to Johnson. Um, so we make sure that we're going to know how to control the observatory um, as far as uh, tuning the optics uh, remotely and knowing how each one of those mirrors can actually be controlled and defined. Then in 2017, we start the observatory testing. So this is a picture of Chamber A without the Pathfinder in it and actually from the outside. Um, it is completely different than if you'd ever seen pictures of it before, because um, now it's in its own clean room um, for the observatory's sake. It's absolutely massive. You can see the tiny little people standing at the bottom. Yes, this is a real picture and not um, an engineering uh, depiction. This is what the full observatory is going to look like inside of uh, Chamber A. You can see that it's just big enough that we can actually deploy the secondary and do the optical end-to-end -end tests. So currently, um, as I said, the Pathfinder's down there testing the optical test equipment, which sits at the top, or is housed at the top of this chamber. Um, it's lowered here in the, the picture on the right, where you can actually see that it's quite a complex series of instruments um, and testing devices for, for this test. <clears throat> but we don't wanna have to go put goggles on JWST or glasses. Okay, so then in 2018, it's launch and integration. So where are we and how do we get there? So right now we're, te we're testing um, the ISIM, or the uh, Instrument Science Module. Um, it's almost complete. Um, and we're putting the mirrors on the primary black back plane and the secondary. Uh, once those are both independently done, we then install the instruments to the observatory. Um, and this is called the Optical Telescope Assembly. That is then um, tested down at Johnson, where we do the end-to-end -end optical test. In the meanwhile, um, the sun shield's going through INT. The spacecraft is, as I said, already completed and delivered. Um, we assemble those um, down at Northrop Grumman um, after the optical test done at Johnson, uh, where the full sun shield observatory spacecraft bus is installed to the telescope and the instruments. Everything's folded up, shoved in a rocket, and launched. So here's a brief summary of what I just said, um, and it gives you sort of a pictorial description of what it's actually going to look like through that process. But I hope from all of this you learned that JWST is going to be a phenomenal observatory. It's a full, ca fully capable observatory for detecting our first stars of our universe, but even for looking at the big bright targets in their own solar system, including things like Mars, comets, the ice giants, the gas giants, their satellites, small bodies, and even those things that are flying across the Earth um, at hundreds of thousands of miles per hour. <clears throat> Where to learn more? Um, please vid visit us. Um, there's multiple places, including jwst.nasa.gov. Um, Space Telescope, or the Operations Center, also has a, a website that's dedicated to JWST. This is also where you'll submit your proposals. Um, the European Space Agency and Canadian Space Agencies also support JWST, and you can find it through their web pages, as well as our primary contractor, Northrop Grumman. Um, we have a, an extensive collection of pictures and videos, so please look at our Flickr page. Um, there's all kinds of uh, social media. Um, and our webcam, which I encourage you to watch over the next few weeks, uh, especially, so you can see the actual telescope integration. My email is at the bottom of the page.
please feel free to email me or contact me if you have any questions. Um, also, if you're interested about the solar system um, science in particular, um, there is a, sp a particular page dedicated to the solar system science through the Space Telescope page. So with that, I'm going to show you the launch video. I believe I have some time. Um, so let me figure out how to do this. Wait. Actually, we are starting to run a little short on time. We have a few okay. questions we'd like to ask, if that's OK. OK. Do you want me to still play the video in the background or not? Um, Let's not do the video in the background at the moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we just have a few. We might still have time after we get through our questions. So All right. We'll see. No problem. Cool. Uh, first question is actually from uh, Dustin Edgman, and he was wondering uh, whenever, let's see, with the Hubble no longer being serviced, will we have any future plans for any uh, space telescopes in the visible spectrum? Can the James Webb do anything there, or is it all infrared straight? Um, we hit the far end of the visible, but we aren't optimized to do observations. Um, right now, NASA has put out a call for um, supporting science and technology for the next generation telescope beyond JWST. And one of the initiatives is uh, a UV and optical telescope um, that actually I think will go into the, the near infrared as well, not quite as far as JWST. but. Um, there is plan, or there are people thinking about what the, the follow-up or the actual successor to Hubble should be. Um, there's also a number of ground-based observatories that are being built, um, even though they're not um, by the U.S. for per se. Um, but there are a number of large, you know, 30-meter class telescopes that are being built on the ground that should be ideal as well to support the optical spectrum. Cool. Thank you. We have a couple of questions that are actually kind of related, so I'm going to sort of bundle them here. Okay. Um, John B. asked, why is it necessary to avoid the Earth's shadow by orbiting in the L2 point? And also, Jeffrey asks, is there room at L2 for more than one observatory? Uh, yes. So L2 was where the Herschel Space Observatory was. Um, it was actually in orbit as well, and um, the Planck mission. So these were two um, far infrared observatories that um, recently completed their mission um, that were uh, provided through the European Space Agency. Um, so there's plenty of room out there still. Um, we orbit at L2 uh, basically because we do have a small solar panel and we do need, um, we are dependent on getting some power from the sun. Um, but being in that orbit, we still have direct access to the Earth, which is why we get multiple points uh, where we can do um, data uplinking and downlinking uh, multiple times a day. Cool, thank you. Um, Stuart asks, uh, why will the James Webb be used to study Mars versus, uh, he says there's quite a few probes in orbit and more will be added, so he's wondering why, what advantage the James Webb have versus their, the probes and their closer perspective. So um, we have a couple of advantages. Um, I agree that nothing's going to be the same as putting a rover on there and smelling it. However, if you want to know, um, the rover's only going to detect exactly what it's standing on. It's not going to detect anything across the globe. Um, and the same for an orbiter. It's only going to detect what it's exactly orbiting over at that given time. Um, and you only get small swaths of, of coverage at a time. They don't have a full global map that they can do um, within 30 seconds, for example. They have to do this over the course of a year or months. Um, so JWST gets that nice snapshot, but we also get the spatial resolution, not quite as good as an orbiter, um, obviously, but we do get nice spatial resolution, which is actually better than what we can do from the ground. And with respect to the ground, um, we cover wavelengths that we can't do from the ground. So that's where JWST really complements the science. We have a technical question here um, about the camera, camera systems, I guess, on the James Webb. Um, how old will the cameras actually be when it's actually finally put into orbit? Um, so these, all the instruments um, were new, develop, uh, new technology developments. Um, as I said, we have brand new detectors that we just got uh, last year. So the detectors are actually only a year old now, maybe a year and a half. Um, so whenever it's in orbit, it's only going to be a few, they're only going to be a few years old. 
um, and we haven't even completed them yet until the end of this cryovac test when the instruments are actually delivered to the project as complete objects. Cool. Let's see. Oh, um, here's a really interesting one from uh, Joe Wright. Um, he heard that machinists were actually brought out of retirement to mill the instrument platform because some of their uh, CNC machines couldn't tell when the, a piece might fail. Their tactile abilities, the human tactile ability, um, could tell if the metal was being overstressed or not. Have you heard anything about this? Or I actually haven't, but I really wouldn't be surprised. Oh, wow. Um, we have some amazing um, people with experience that you just you can't buy um, or can you produce um, as a machine. Um, there's a lot of human factor that goes into this observatory, including when we're doing our testing. While we can run an, uh, a cryovac test, for example, on all our instruments right now, we have a number of people that are supporting each instrument every single day, 24 hours a day, um, looking at that data, trying to oversee something that um, you know even our own our own technology and engineering couldn't detect. Mm -hmm. Cool. We have another good question here. Uh, Jeffrey asks. Um, is the tracking for the James Webb done by reaction wheels or with fuel, like hydrogen thrusters, or some combination of both? Um, so we have um, reaction wheels, um, and we have fuel. So um, most of the tracking isn't done with fuel. Um, that's mostly for orbit stabilization um, and momentum unloading. Um, but most of it is actually done with the, the trackers. Cool. And with that, um, is there any way to tell if there'll be a little, the reaction was a little bit more um, robust than Kepler's? Or are there extra redundancies built in? Or? Yes, we have more redundancy and we are not using the same ones as Kepler. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I think that might be a different contractor too with Kepler. I'm not certain. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, let's see what else we got here. We got a, we got a bunch now. Oh, um, Let's see. Oh, um, Michael Overasker was asking, over Acker, not over Asker. It's not an over asking. This is a very good question. Um, how interested is the James Webb Space Telescope team in producing images to keep the public interested and um, helping maintain the positive attitudes and everything for future funding? Like the, the great, awesome pictures like Hubble and Herschel yeah, yeah. made. Um, actually, this is the best part about planetary science because the biggest press releases that, and images that ever come out of Hubble um, or even Spitzer actually were from planetary science. So that was one of the main drivers for getting a planetary scientist involved. Um, but yes, there is a huge initiative. This is why we have so much social media, um, why we do these outreach events. Um, we're really interested in what the public thinks about it. Um, we're, we have a, a plan for delivery of our first images and spectrum, so everybody is able to see how fantastic the observatory is at the first glimpse. Cool. Another question actually about the observatory and seeing it, uh, Joe Ray was asking when he was at the Goddard for training, he seen that there is a tabletop model of the James Webb in like every building. Um, do you know of a source to get the model or is that just something special from the contractor? Um, I think they're special. I've begged for one. <laughs> <laughs> I do know, I've heard of a few, um, oh, what are they called? They're these um, online web sourcing uh, funding projects. There is there is a group of students that actually make tiny little um, 3D models that you can buy. I did find one. We actually gave one away as a prize. Um, so it's the unofficial one, but it's from Mesa Tech. And they actually have, depending on how much you want to pay for it, they have different models one of them does do the panels unfolding. Oh, uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, totally I think, I think things there. like that are great. Um, there is also a Lego model, which I, I don't even have either. Oh, so wow. um, <laughs> watch on eBay for the Lego model of JWST. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Oh, um, a question from, we have an anonymous question. Um, are there any concerns about the telescope being hit by any space junk or debris while in orbit? Um, so we've done a couple of studies. Uh, micrometeorites are our biggest concern. Um, this is where having the five layers of the sun shield is actually quite a benefit for us. Because um, if we get one that punctures, hopefully it's not big enough to puncture all five layers and create a light leak for us. Um, so hopefully that uh, 
we have that redundancy for, for the sun shields purposes and keeping the observatory cool. Things are going to hit. Um, we've also looked at things like even cosmic rays hitting our instruments or even just the observatory in general and how much that's going to affect um, anything electronic-wise within the observatory. And we've um, built in a lot of safety for that, um, a lot of grounding harnesses going throughout the observatory and making sure all the things that, are, that could get hit that have access to the outside um, are, are safe and not touching any instruments. Cool. We have a couple more questions. Um, then we'll have to, we actually have a bunch of questions. So <laughs> we have to, it's 10 o'clock on Stephanie's clock, and we got to cut it short <laughs> soon. Um, but we know Dave, um, he raised his hand, he had a question. Um, what would be the effect on um, space telescopes if, for some terrible reason, the James Webb happened to fail or got its mission cut short? Um, I think it would be very detrimental. Um, the whole community is now sort of on board and supporting JWST just because it's been the up and coming for so long and it's state of the art and we really need a new space observatory uh, in the near infrared mm -hmm. um, through the mid infrared just because we don't have access to that in, in space. So if something were to happen, I think it would be very detrimental. Like I said, NASA is already looking at what's going to follow JWST. So if it fails, that's going to be a huge hit, and I, I would hate to think of what that could happen. What could happen for NASA um, if we if we weren't successful? But as I said, we you saw how much test and time that's been devoted to testing all of our equipment, making sure everything's going to deploy fine. Um, it's the best we can do on the ground, um, and hopefully, it all works perfectly. We had a chat about this earlier, and I remember you said, um, "Well, I asked you a similar question, and you just we basically just were like, oh." It's just going to launch and work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think uh, working for the project, I'm allowed to think of it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. I think it's just still so fresh in everyone's minds because of Hubble and the famous servicing mission there. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why we're doing this this end-to-end -end optical test down at well, Like you pointed out, they checked it on the, the focus on the ground before launch. <laughs> yeah, so every mirror is fully controllable and fully steerable. So... Um, that's sort of what we're testing here is to know how to actually do that full focusing um, on the ground So when we are deployed we we can do that remotely cool. We have one. We'll do our final question I'm actually rounding up a couple questions into this. They're similar Bruce Nevin Nevin and um, James Rockford um, They're asking um, um, Some of the science instruments are installed on what will be the looks like the hot side of the observatory. No, they're on the cold side oh, Okay, cool mm -hmm. So what kind of shielding and um, measures are there for just to handle like, um, like say any coronal mass ejections or any um, radiation bursts or stuff, stuff like that, radiation hardening, I guess. And yeah, yeah. Um, we, well, all of our instrument, well, all of the, the primary housing is rad hard. That, that has to be rad hard for anything launched in space. Um, but we do have some access points that we do have shields. Um, most of our instruments are, like I showed you, are quite embedded and it's, it's not easy to access them. Mm -hmm. Outside of all of that, there was another image that um, shows you how it's actually shielded and protected on the outside. But there are a few minor access points and that's what I was saying. Um, we made sure anything that was within those access points actually um, isolated electronically such that it's not going to zap our instruments or turn them off or um, burn them out in any way that would be detrimental. Um, we've done tons of studies on this. In fact, they're still going on. Um, we have people working all over the country on this, so uh, we're, we're anticipating it might, it could happen. Um, hopefully it doesn't, but um, if it does, we, we know how to save the, the observatory. Cool. Awesome. The NASA magic. <laughs> cool. Okay, um, just one brief one. Um, after its launch, uh, this is from John, how long will we have to wait until we see what the observatory is capable of doing? I guess when we get our great data starting to come back. Um, so commissioning is going to take about 120 days from launch. Uh, so we have a couple of months where we actually have to unfold the telescope. It takes a full month to get to L2 and unfold the telescope. Um, which, if you go to the deployment video, I'll actually try to find the link right now and put it in the chat for you. Um, Thank you. Then uh, you'll see how, uh, where's my chat button? There it is. Okay. Um, you'll see how long it takes. It actually gives you a, the timeline um, at the top. 
uh, so you can see how many days. Um, so after that, we have to commission it. So we have to turn all the instruments on and test them one by one and make sure everything's working as it should. We need to make sure that we can move the telescope at 30 milli arc seconds per second. We need to make sure that we can actually tune the mirrors as we expected, and we need to characterize the observatory. So we expect some dust to actually get on the mirrors as we launch. There's nothing we can do about that, and as it's actually getting out to L2. Um, hopefully it's not too much, but we will need to actually do a full characterization once we get out there. Mm -hmm. Excellent. A few months. Yeah, sounds like it. That'll be a tense few months, I bet. <laughs> yeah, unlike Mars, we don't have the seven minutes of terror. I think we got four months of terror. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Well, we're getting a little late, and we have a bunch of questions. Would it be okay if I sent you a few of our questions via email, and we could put it in our follow-up article? Awesome. Absolutely. Cool. Thank you so much. And yeah, as Barry actually said, and I think he speaks for everyone here, uh, thank you, Dr. Milan, for enlightening us all about the James Webb Space Telescope. Absolutely. Thank you. Cool. And take care, and um, good luck with the snow tonight over there. <laughs> Uh, we don't get it till Friday, so. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, have a good night. Thank you for taking the time to speak to us and all the members yeah. out here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Take care. <laughs>